All right, hello and uh, welcome everybody. I'm gonna talk to you in this lecture about soil health. I'm gonna give you a big picture kind of conceptual approach to this topic, which oftentimes gets too far down in the weeds initially, in my opinion, um, metaphorically speaking. Uh, and I'm also gonna provide some perspective from you know maybe a standpoint of gardeners or small farmers uh, in terms of how you might apply some of these ideas in practice. So um, just a little bit more uh, about myself. Uh, my name is Chris Wilson. I'm faculty member in the agronomy department. Uh, I'm an agroecologist. So I study of the ecosystem processes that go on in our agricultural systems, particularly interested in the flows of carbon and energy, the implications of different kinds of uh, agricultural systems and practices on uh, climate change and uh, several other topics as well. A lot of my work has been in the context of pastures and increasingly now getting into some row crops as well and some tree crops, but a lot of it has had this kind of background focus in pasture and grazing land. However, uh, on a more personal note, I've been involved in, in gardening uh, for vegetable production for a really long time. Uh, it was one of my uh, it's a hobby that goes back to when I was in high school and then in college, I spent a couple of summers working on a diverse uh, organic vegetable farm up in northern Michigan. Uh, really positive, great experience, learned a lot. Um, and then as well as uh, spending some time farming in New England and then a lot of seasons here in Florida. I think <clears throat> my wife and I were just tallying up that this uh, current fall season was going to be something like our 20th garden that we put in together. Uh, so <laughs> this picture kind of shows some of our more recent uh, endeavors in this space. Uh, on here on the left, we've got a high tunnel situation that we recently put up uh, in the past year. So this past spring, we, we grew our uh, tomatoes, our other solanaceous crops, eggplant, peppers, and so on in there. Uh, here's a picture of our, our son at the time, um, Silas. Uh, he really loves being out in the garden as well. Um, a little budding garden helper. Um, and over here is a picture of some broccoli that we produced. We ran a small scale CSA a few years ago uh, before I was in this current position um, and uh, grew a variety of vegetables for a few different people. Um, so I, I've always been passionate about growing plants, particularly for food, I'm passionate about the flavor and nutrition um, and what, what really goes into making the best quality plants possible. And so for me, this topic of soil health often comes back to this, right? Like at the end of the day, what we're trying to do for the most part is uh, produce plants that are bountiful, beautiful, healthy, delicious, et cetera, depending on what kind of gardening you're into. Uh, that said, I am a little bit of a soil dork, so I do love thinking about the soil in and of itself, but for me, it, it always has to eventually come full circle. So anyways, uh, outline for, the, for today, we're going to discuss the concept of soil health, and then I'm going to give you kind of a soil health triangle, all right? So we're going to talk, we're going to break this concept into thinking about the soil's physical environment, the soil's chemical environment, and the biological environment. So we'll take those in, in that order. And then we'll talk a little bit about along the way and towards the end, some ideas of, well, how do we manage these different aspects of the soil? How do we measure and then, and then correspondingly manage them? So before I jump into the rest of this, I do want you to just pause for a moment, think about what have you heard about this concept of soil health? What does it mean to you? And are there anything, any things that you're doing currently with this idea? Um, are there certain things that you measure in the soil, any indicators that you're kind of targeting and adjusting your practices around. Um, so yeah, I'm just, it's something I'm very curious about. Uh, and hopefully at some point we'll have a chance to be live together and talk through some of this stuff more. Okay, so I wanna zoom back just for a second and we're talking about soil health. And so that second word there, health, is a really big concept. And I think it, you, uh, it's actually hard to define, hard to pin down, but it's a concept that, that we have to think about in the context of all living systems. So there's something to do with living systems with biology and this idea of health. So one particular definition that I, I like to work with, and it's not an exclusive one, 
So there's also absence of disease. Okay, that's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, just got over a nasty cold myself. So I'm very familiar with uh, disease uh, and the absence of disease being a very wonderful thing. Uh, but we, I think we all intuitively sense that there's something more than just absence of a specific disease or, or you know, discomfort or something like that that goes on with what does it mean to be healthy? So I think one aspect of this is that health is the appropriate, necessarily dynamic balance between processes that are responsible for building us up, for growth, repair, restoration. And so the technical term for that would be anabolism. So we see that, excuse me, on the left-hand side of this figure versus the processes responsible for breaking down, so releasing energy from food substrate, from the stuff that we eat and how our body turns that into energy and nutrients for us. Recycling damage and old tissue, clearing out. And so collectively, those are kind of referred to as catabolism. So these are just big clusters that involve, you know, thousands of metabolic processes under each rubric. But there's some idea that we need this balance of building up and breaking down to underlie what it means to be a healthy living system. So I'm just going to park that there and we'll come back to some of these ideas in the context of soil in a little bit. But first we have to talk about then, okay, we have health, now we need to think about what actually is soil. So soil is this really wonderful stuff that I think poetically we can think of this as the skin of the biosphere. It's a very, very thin layer. And if we think about like a transect through the earth, starting from the surface, going down to the core, most of it's like the mantle, right? It's, it's uh, this, we're, we're uh, an enormous geologic entity. And there's this thin little layer, the epidermal layer of soil that's right on the surface. And that's gonna depend on the type of living organisms that are occupying a given area for a very long period of time. So it's soil is made out of the activity of plants, microorganisms and various life forms, animals or fauna that live in the soil as that these things then interact with the weathering of the geologic material that underlies us. So no matter where you're standing, if you're on solid ground, there's like parent material underneath you at some depth that might be weathering out. So here in Florida, we're familiar with the, you know, the limestone Floridian aquifer, right? And um, depending on where, <clears throat> where you are, there's going to be different depths till you get to some kind of parent material like limestone or some parts of the country, it might be like granite, okay? Um, that mineral matter that weathers out of the rocks is then what is supplying ultimately the nutrients that the plants are, uh, are taking up out of the soil. Well, it's just the whole structure of the soil. So you've got mineral material, you've got air and you've got water and you've got organic life and it's constant churn interacting together. So we have on this left-hand side here, a sense of, okay, we've got geologically, we break things down into volcanic or igneous rock, sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock, all of this has to weather. So it's, it's the breakdown of that material, the catabolism, if you will, of that rock material that then releases the nutrients that are needed to support microbial and plant life. And so that interaction then happens and becomes soil. Okay, so again, just really brief bird's eye view here. In the US, we have this system of um, taxonomy that we've developed. And so the word taxonomy is quite deliberate here. This is a concept that comes right out of evolutionary biology, our understanding of the relatedness of forms of life. Well, there's taxonomy of soils that reflects variations in the parent material. So the ultimate rock stuff that they're made out of, the type of vegetation, and really importantly, the kind of climate that is happening because the temperature, the humidity, those factors determine the rate of weathering that breakdown or catabolism of those rocks. So we've got this sequence of soils that are basically in different stage, stages of weathering. So this is bookended by totally young soils called entosols that haven't weathered at all. And then oxisols, which we see a lot in tropical areas where they've been exposed to high temperature and high humidity for very long periods of time that have weathered considerably. And so it's no accident that the most 
agriculturally productive soils are found in the middle, particularly in these mollusols or these grassland soils. So again, think about this balance, breaking down, building up. Um, this applies as well in the case of soils. Then we have a variety of soils that are context specific, like andesols that develop on volcanic uh, ashes and residue. And um, our favorite here in Florida is spodosols. So question, uh, is there then an ideal healthy soil? Well, I think it's a bit, to use another um, analogy here, this in this case to human biology, it's a bit like asking, is there some optimal body type for running as an activity? So on the left-hand side here, we've got a picture of Haile Gebrselazi and Paul Turgot, two of the most famous marathon runners of all time. Um, this is at the conclusion of a race, uh, and in this particular one, uh, Hila is, is winning. And on the right-hand side here, we have Michael Johnson, one of the greatest uh, sprinters, track and field athletes of all time. See huge divergences here in their, in their body type, right? Um, both, all these gentlemen are at the top of their sports. They're all extremely lean, but we see very like much less pronounced muscular development in the case of people ideally adapted for running over long distances. If we were to zoom with an echocardiogram into the hearts of these gentlemen, we'd find that they had probably had very large, particularly left ventricles, so they could sustain a very high aerobic output for a long period of time. Whereas we see much more obvious, um, you know, an anabolism and muscular development, in the case of Michael Johnson, much more suited for short bursts of power. So this is just a very like, for those of you who might be sports fans, the rest of you, this is just like blah, 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 blah. But if you're into athletics, I think this is a very intuitive idea that there's never an optimal, like an overall optimal. There's just sort of, it depends on your goal. It depends on what you want to be good at. And then you kind of get different levels of fitness for that particular thing. So on that theme or on that topic, um, if we compare the state soils of Florida and Iowa, we're going to see some pretty pronounced differences. Okay, Florida state soil, for those you don't know, that's the Mayaka series. This is an example of a spodosol. A spodosol is a type of soil that develops in a uh, seasonally inundated kind of environment. So here in Florida, we have a lot of these flatwoods kind of habitats where we've got oaks, palmettos, um, you know, wire grass, kind of herbaceous layer as well. And this, if you've been in these flatwoods during the summer months, during our monsoon season, basically when you're walking around, it's like splish, 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 you're, right? you're totally waterlogged. As we get into winter, especially a drier winter, it's going to recede and drain. And so this cyclical waterlogging leads to a very specific type of soil development that occurs that results in, in what we have here, the, these spodosols. So we've got a, a thin layer of topsoil or A horizon here. We've got this E horizon, which is very strongly leached of nutrients and minerals. And then we have a B horizon where a lot of that stuff that is leached has accumulated. So this is a very particular type of soil. This is really, really good if you wanna grow a flatwoods type of ecosystem. Over here in Iowa, we have one of these mollusols that I pointed out in that weathering sequence. It's in the middle. Uh, this is very deep soil. So we have a very like, you know, deep uh, surface horizon of it's enriched in organic material, very fertile. And then we have, you know, the, uh, the rest of the profile also contains a considerable amount of fertility as well. So if you're trying to grow tall grass prairie or annual crops like corn, soy, wheat, things like that, this is an excellent soil to be working with, much better than this one. So again, context specific. One of these soils isn't healthier than the other. Uh, rather, you have to define that health with respect to an ecosystem type that is either going to evolve in some place or is something that we are managing deliberately for. Okay, so I know that that's some big picture ideas. There's a lot that we could unpack and talk about there, but I you know, want to keep this relatively contained. So we're going to move into then some more nuts and bolts of measuring and assessing soil health with respect to these three components of the soil biology, the physical environment, and the chemical environment. 
I just figure I've drawn, the, drawn these arrows two ways. So all these things are connected to each other. And that's what I wanna emphasize is that we can make these distinctions <clears throat> as we break this stuff down and talk about it. But you should always realize that all this stuff is very deeply interactive. And so I'm gonna highlight a few of the things that will connect your biology to your chemistry and your physical environment to your biological environment and so on and so forth. And soil health then is sort of like an emergent property or an emergent description of the balance among these factors. So that's what we have to think about here. Okay, physical environment. So I've sort of alluded to this already. Um, soils, when they are developing and if they're in good shape, roughly speaking, are going to have physical structure. It's going to have a vertical structure to it. So this is kind of like a very typical like forest deciduous like temperate soil here. We would have an O horizon, which is where organic material, detritus, leaves, things like that are falling and are accumulating. We've got lots of activity of um, <clears throat> fauna, insects, and so forth that are dwelling in this area, helping to break down that material. This is leading into the enriched A horizon, the top soil as we refer to it, that is a mixture of the minerals of the soil and the organic nutrients that are being added over time. And then underneath that, we've got the B horizon and the C horizon, and then we get down to, well, the C horizon is basically the, the parent material, the ultimate mineral stuff that is the, the physical skeleton out of which the soil is constructed. Okay. We also think about the uh, textural composition of the soil. This has a lot of impacts on the various properties that will concern us as gardeners, farmers, scientists. Um, soil texture is basically just the percentage composition of different particle size classes. And so we basically say, okay, anything over 50 micrometers at sand, two to 50 is silt and less than two is gonna be your clay. Now there's this textural pyramid, many of you have probably seen that allows you to then classify your soil into one of these types. So if we've got, uh, let's just say we've got 60% sand, we run that up and we've got 20% uh, clay, that gives us 80%. And then we're looking at, well, what, you know, the remainder would be composed of the silt. And um, at that, that level, uh, we're in, we're in a, a loam category, okay? Yeah, or any other um, category that we happen to fall into. Um, yeah, my apologies. I think I read that off wrong there, obviously. So to get this right, <laughs> shows you it's been a little while since I've done one of these. Um, we'd actually start here at the 40 and then you follow it up this direction. So we go 40% sand intersecting with 20% clay and then 40% up here uh, silt. So there's these little hash marks if you have really sharp eyes that indicate the direction that you should go up these lines. Anyways, not that important. Uh, the idea is if you have a balance of these three particle uh, size types, you have what we call a loamy soil. These have very good properties for a lot of our plant production purposes. To go to the beach, right, you're basically 100% sand, or even if you're not at the beach, like if you're in a lot of parts of Florida, then we've got 95 to 100% sand pretty much everywhere, and we've got sands, um, and those have very interesting properties, really good for some things, not good for others. This composition will then determine a lot about the drainage, so how well you hang on to water, drain, it, drain away excesses of water, and it's going to have really big implications for your fertility, for your ability to hang on to cations and anions, which are these charged, you know, forms of minerals that are important for plant nutrition. Okay, the other thing to think about here is that the soil is a habitat, and so there's this whole enormous below ground ecosystem going on, and we'll talk about the players in that when we discuss soil biology, but there's interplay there between the physical structure of the soil and then its quality and suitability as a habitat. And then the biology that responds to that actually feeds back and impacts the physical structure of the soil. So I really like this uh, figure from this classic paper by two 
uh, ecologists, soil scientists, uh, Elliot and Coleman, 88. Um, they're showing an image here of a, of a plant root that's growing through the soil. And you've got all these little fine roots coming off of it. And what this is showing is this intricate interplay between root systems. We've got our soil fauna, like our insects. We've got our fungi and bacteria. Those, those players, the fungi, the plant roots, and so on, are actually secreting substances that cause soil particles to stick together into these, what we call aggregates. And these aggregates then play a lot of role in the soil. They help protect organic matter. So the more aggregation you have, the higher your organic matter content. <clears throat> they provide this structure in the soil that makes it a more suitable habitat. So you have a more robust below ground ecosystem, the more structure that you have. So it's sort of like life begets life in that sense. So uh, here on the right, we're showing a picture that I took uh, up in Illinois. This was sort of in a uh, abandoned field that had been in clover and grass for just a few years. And it's showing this beautiful aggregation. You can see these little uh, crumbs. And actually, this is referred to as crumb structure. So it's a little bit like when you're looking at a good sourdough bread and you've got these different air pockets of different sizes, uh, the, the aggregate structure in the soil should have that kind of quality to it. This is something that develops particularly when you have sufficient clay and silt. So if you don't have enough of that, then you're not going to get this kind of aggregation kind of crumb structure developing. When you do see it, this is a really good marker that you have a healthy, vital soil. So this tells you a lot of things kind of in one image, and then you can get your senses involved. You can kind of feel how it crumbles and falls apart in your hand. You can smell it. There'll be a very, you know, distinct odors of soils in different area, depending on their composition of fungi and plants and things like that. So again, brief overview here, lots more that could be said about this. When we're assessing the soil physical environment, then trying to pull together some of these ideas. There are things you can measure. You can measure that soil texture. Most soil labs will do that for you. You can do what's called the ribbon test, where you are basically um, smushing the soil. You want it to be a little bit moist, but not quite sopping. And then you are trying to press out and see how long of a ribbon you can extrude from between your thumb and forefinger before it falls apart. The longer the ri ribbon you can produce, the higher the content of clay that you have in that soil. So that's kind of a hands-on method you can use. Give you the answer. Here in Florida, most of the time you're talking mostly sand. Okay, compaction, uh, you can assess this. Um, a, a poor physical environment would be very compressed together, heavy machinery, overgrazing of, of animals, things like that. Aggregation can be like that structure can also be assessed. You can also visually see it like we were looking at in that picture. This thing called the water infiltration test. So this is measuring the ability of how well does your soil absorb water? This is a really key property, particularly in drier systems, um, but it's good to think about in, in most, most ecosystems as well. And so there are standardized ways you can do that. And we see a picture of this here where you have a beaker with kind of a known quantity of water, and then you are <clears throat> exposing a controlled volume of soil to that water and seeing how long it takes to absorb all of it. So if you have problems infiltrating water to the soil, you're gonna have more of it running off you're going to be losing water and potentially losing nutrients. And then you can look for the presence of macroarthropods. If you have a lot of earthworms in your soil, generally speaking, that tells you that a lot of other things are going well. Okay, so chemical environment, what do we include in this? Probably the number one um, kind of master property to concern yourself with would be the soil pH, the balance of acidity, alkalinity in the soil. Um, this has a lot of different implications. One of the major ones is that it impacts the availability of all the nutrients that your plants need for their production. And I think a lot of people who've been around farming and gardening kind of aware of this, have seen this a lot of different times, not going to belabor it too much. You just kind of, you want that balanced pH reaction. But here again, here again, we have context specificity. So if you're trying to grow blueberries, you want an acidic soil. It's actually good for you. So a healthy soil from the standpoint, of blueberry production will look different with respect to pH than a healthy soil with respect to trying to grow the best quality kale or you know whatever else that you, you're concerned with. pH affects the ability, the, the nutrient reserves as well. 
not going to get into that too much. Um, microbial activity. So the bacteria and fungi in the soil prefer to have different kinds of pH. So if you get way out into the extremes in either direction, their, their activity can be suppressed and therefore you're going to lose some of those functions of the soil that depend on, on them. So we have some simple ways to measure this. Again, many of you have seen this lime basalt. So this is a type of rock that can be added. There's a lot of interesting uh, of interest that's, that's coming about uh, the use of this because it can actually also help take up carbon out of the atmosphere when you put it in the soil and let it react. So um, I've got a news story here that then links to some research that some of you may be interested to follow on that topic. If you have too much, if your soils are too alkaline um, for whatever reason here in Florida, this can happen. Like if you're in the Miami Dade area, right, you can have just limestone based soils that are inherently calcareous or strongly alkaline. You have to approach those much differently than other kinds of soil. Uh, you can also have if you're the water that you're getting with that's coming out of the Florida aquifer has a lot of limestone in it, dissolved in it. This is the case at, at my house, for instance. So we're constantly sort of mitigating against that excessive buildup of lime over time. And you can do that with applications of elemental sulfur, acid forming fertilizers. Okay, the CEC, the cation exchange capacity and a related concept called anion exchange capacity or AEC. This is an index of the potential fertility of your soil. It's sort of like the size of your soil's engine, if you will. Um, this cation exchange capacity basically reflects char negatively charged surface area that develops particularly on certain clay minerals and also on various organic molecules and particularly when clay and organic molecules come together and interact in the soil, they can develop a lot of surface area that has a, um, a slight negative charge to it. And what that negative charge does is it then attracts and can help retain positively charged nutrient cations. So calcium, magnesium, potassium, uh, ammonium, uh, one of the major sources of uh, forms of nitrogen, is also positively charged. So the they're basically your content of organic matter, your content of these different kinds of clays, clay minerals is going to then sum up together to give you a good sense of what your cation exchange capacity is. This is something that could be measured and is often measured as part of routine soil testing from various labs. Um, there's a concept called base saturation, which is basically how much of your potential reserve of fertility is in fact occupied by these nutrient elements, calcium, magnesium, potassium, versus you could have lots of hydrogen or acidity occupying some of that um, surface area. And so the base saturation that you're aiming for, again, is going to depend on your crop production goals. So for like, you know, ornamentals, it may be different depending on the type of ornamental compared to you want high production of vegetable crops, then you want a very high base saturation with your nutrient elements. Anion exchange capacity is an analogous concept, but for anions, it's going to behave fairly similarly, although there are some nuances and I won't really go into it too much, but like for instance, phosphate and sulfate, phosphorus and sulfur being two major plant nutrients those are often found in anion form. And the ability of the soil to hang on to those is also really critical. So if you have low cation exchange capacity, which is the case in a lot of Florida, um, you can try to build it up a bit through additions of organic material, although there's going to be pretty hard limits to how high you can go. The thing you have to realize is that you need smaller doses of fertility more often. So if you have a light, coarse soil, like we often have a little bit often is much better than a lot all at once. So if you think about, you know, managing fertility as a feeding strategy, many small meals versus one or two large meals is the way you should be kind of thinking about that. When you go to test the nutrient supply in your soil, something I recommend you do at least periodically, not all the time, um, once you've measured your soil a few times, you get, you'll get a pretty strong feel for, for where things are and what you need to do. 
there's a couple concepts that you want to apply. And the biggest thing is that you want to use, be sure that you're using a test that is appropriate for the type of soil that you have. So there's a whole variety of soil tests that are out there. Um, you can consult with, um, you know, the UF IFAS uh, soil testing services to get some baseline idea of what types of soil testing procedures are appropriate if you're here in Florida. And then what do you do with that information? So let's say they give you back some information of how many parts per million of different nutrients you have in your soil. Well, what we're going for is we want to have a balanced nutrient supply. So balanced plant nutrition. In general, there's a sweet spot. We have not too much, not too little of a whole, of all the major and, and micronutrients that uh, support your plant production. And so there's it for any given nutrient, we're going to see this sort of relationship with ultimately our plant yield and our plant quality, where we can be deficient and therefore suffering from that. But we can also have excessive amounts. Most nutrients are going to have a pretty broad and generous plateau range or a range of uh, levels over which the plants will do just fine. And within that range, the main thing is just that if you go like, let's say here versus here with your target, it's just about how much money you're spending and how many resources you're using. So this would just be perhaps a little bit wasteful. You want to get to this sort of sweet spot here, but balanced across everything that your plants need. And again, a lot of this, there's a science to it. There's also a strong art to it. And our testing procedures are never perfect. Um, and so what I recommend is careful observation, build your experience over time, pull tests, see how your plants respond to different kinds of amendments, and just build up that site-specific kind of knowledge and wisdom. And I think that's, that's what really good gardeners, good farmers are defined by, I think, in a lot of cases. It's, it's that patience to really learn the system that you are working in. Okay, biological environment. We're getting into the home stretch here. The key, as I said before, is the, the soil is a below ground ecosystem. There's a whole food web that we refer to. It has many different levels to it. And you'll notice the base of the food web is the organic matter in the soil. So these are wastes, residues, metabolites from plants, animals, and microbes that have been deposited into the soil. So this can come from leaves, you know, dying and then shedding and turning over into litter on the soil that breaks down. Most importantly, in a lot of cases, it comes from the root systems. And again, this talk, you know, I didn't put it in the title, but we have a little bit of a focus, advertised focus at least on the rhizosphere or the root environment. Key idea here is a root system, particularly of uh, like grass plants and, and herbaceous plants like that. The root systems are often a major source of that carbon, that organic material that gets deposited into the soil. So ultimately then, where is this organic matter coming from? It's coming from photosynthesis. Plants, photosynthesizing organisms are fixing the carbon out of the air, building up their bodies with it. And then that's what goes in the soil and has these profound effects. The base in terms of the living organisms here are your microbes your fungi, your bacteria, your archaea, these play a whole different variety of roles in the soil. And then a healthy soil is actually going to have a variety of these trophic levels. So we've got nematodes and protozoa feeding on the fungi and the bacteria. We've got predatory nematodes feeding on our uh, grazing nematodes and protozoa. We've got arthropods of different sizes. Um, we've got larger animals and birds eating the arthropods. The more trophic levels you have at play, the more robust and vital this is as an ecosystem. So that's why I said before that you can kind of use the presence of your macrofauna, your, your large soil arthropods, your earthworms, the activity of birds and things like that as indicators of how robust and vital the lower levels are. Okay, so microbes are the engine. Um, they play multiple ro roles in the soil. Big one, they are the decomposers of soil organic matter. So they do that activity of catabolism. Um, and then that, what that does is it releases energy, carbon, and surplus nutrients. 
especially if that organic material is of high enough quality. And then those surplus nutrients go back and support further plant production and kind of close the circuit that way. Uh, those surplus nutrients can then be assimilated by both plants and other microbes, or they could be stored in, the, in your cation exchange capacity. So these different components of the soil all start to play together here. And as I said before, you can use the higher trophic levels as sort of like bio indicators that things are going well at the levels beneath them. Okay, so organic matter is one of the key properties, key indicators, key things about this soil as ecosystem perspective. It's very important for soil fertility and health. And the management is then very important to it. So we have a lot of influence over soil organic matter. So <clears throat> this is kind of a classic textbook time series of organic matter uh, from the uh, mid Midwest United States uh, a system converted early 1900s into row crop agriculture that practices a certain type of uh, conventional plowing. We see a profound loss of organic matter over time. So roughly 50% loss over the period of uh, 50, 60 years. So a lot of carbon that went up into the atmosphere. Then as management practices shift, as we in this case move to a more reduced tillage, uh, we can then reverse those losses and begin to accumulate organic matter again. And so there are actually a whole variety of practices that you can do, uh, many of them suited, more or less suited to different scales of operation. As gardeners, you're probably very familiar with mulching, with adding compost and all that stuff, which is a great way to really step hard on the, you know, accelerator pedal of organic matter buildup in the soil. But there are a variety of things that you want to kind of put together here. Um, <clears throat> what does organic matter do in addition to providing the energy and nutrients that we talk about? It lowers the bulk density, bulk density and soil compaction. So it improves the physical environment of the soil, also increasing water infiltration and water holding capacity. So if you want to um, reduce the drought proneness of your soils, increasing organic matter is one way to do that. Um, there's also a relationship to the fertility. So it both helps provide additional storage capacity, but it also itself represents a source of nutrients. So as it breaks down, as we talk about, that then releases nutrients that can support plant growth. So what I'm showing you here is from a very recent paper. Um, we've talked you know, in <laughs> agronomy and ecosystem science for a long time about the benefits of organic matter, but actually putting data to it, you know, it can sometimes be uh, tricky. Um, and so this was an experiment where they were growing out wheat in pots, and very carefully manipulated the amount of organic matter that was available to them, which is really hard to do in a very clean scientific fashion. So this is one of the few papers that have done it in a particular way that's very robust. Um, and so what they did was they showed indeed the expected relationship between the organic matter content and soil water holding capacity. So going from very low to very high, it's a profound effect on the soil water holding capacity. It uh, lowers bulk density, so less compaction, better structure, increases the soil microbial biomass, as you would expect, because it's the food source, and then has a mm, pretty negligible impact on soil pH. Okay, um, how is it formed? How is it lost? Microbes are really in the driver's seat of all this, so we've got all these plants and microbial and animal residues going into the soil. Microbes break it down but it turns out the microbes themselves are also the source of a lot of organic material that hangs out for a long time in the soil. And so the key thing is, why is there any organic matter at all? Is that organic matter is often protected from decomposition, protected from microbial enzymes. And that's really key. Because you could do the experiment where you add all this organic matter, like wood chips or plant roots or, you know, plant leaves, put them in a petri dish with microbes, and they'll break it all down in days, weeks, months, at most a year or two, it'll all be gone. So in the, the reason why some of it persists in the soil is the interaction of the mineral and the organic constituents. So this is kind of the amazing thing about soils. And this is something that we're still learning 
a lot about from a basic science point of view. So it's a really cool, really cool area, I think, going on right now. So broadly speaking, two ways that it can be protected from that microbial decomposition can be protected inside these aggregates that we talked about before. And remember, the irony is that microbes, particularly mycorrhizal fungi uh, and plant roots themselves are secreting like what are called polysaccharides are secreting sugars that act as glues that really hold the soil together, but then can provide protection for organic matter. They can also have, can also be interactions between organic molecules and soil particles, like particularly clay particles, and those interactions themselves protect those organic molecules from microbial enzymes. And so this is called organomineral interaction. That's kind of a, the technical term for this. And we are just starting to get really good physical science information about how that process works. And that's what I'm showing here is this is a scanning electron micrograph looking at an aluminum mineral in the soil inter interfacing with organic constituents. And so we are still learning a lot about how this works. Okay, brief pitch here, importance of plant root systems. I've alluded to this already. Um, but just a few things to kind of tie these together in your mind a little bit. The root systems of plants physically hold the soil together. So if you have a really dense, you know, fibrous root system like we often have on our grass plants, our pasture and rangeland plants, that's physically holding the soil together. So if you think about problems like soil erosion, having perennial plant cover is one of the best ways to guard against that because the soil holds together or the roots hold the soil together. The roots are themselves dying and turning over. That's a huge source of organic matter for that soil food web. The roots are not only dying and turning over, the roots themselves trickle feed the soil with amino acids, with sugars, and with various organic acids that can actually act as signaling agents in the soil. So growing living root tips particularly are very leaky. And so the plants are constantly losing some small fraction of what they have gained from photosynthesis right into the soil through this process we call exudation. So they're exuding sugars, exuding amino acids. And what that does is it creates a very dynamic rhizosphere. that's chock full of microbial life and activity, um, very high rates of respiration. This then helps these microbes break down soil minerals and soil organic matter and access and liberate nutrients that can then support further plant production. Lastly, as I've alluded to before, plants and mycorrhizal fungi secrete the polysaccharides, things like glomalin, which you may have heard of, that promote the aggregation of soil and thus its structure and its health. Key takeaways, is there an optimal soil organic matter? So going back to this paper that I mentioned before, Oldfield et al. 2020, there appears to be sort of an optimum in the middle, maybe, uh, but this is only the case for uh, production systems where you are adding lots of nutrients and water and systems where you, you are not adding quite as many resources. It's sort of more of a broad plateau zone, but it does go to show you that you don't get at any rate, you're not getting much benefit going above, let's say, four to six percent organic matter. So there's sometimes this idea that more is always better. But go back to the beginning. The key with organic matter is not just that we have a lot of it sitting around, it's that it is both being built up, it's both the anabolism of new organic material, and it's being broken down. It's being catabolized to release nutrients and energy. And so if you have anabolism and catab catabolism and balance, that's when you're going to get the best, most robust outcomes. So you don't necessarily need to always go for a higher and higher percentage of organic matter. And you can actually get into a lot of trouble overdoing it by trying to push to unrealistic levels. So we want to balance. Uh, there's a critical level that we often talk about of around 2% or higher. This is a very fuzzy kind of thing. But if you want like a simple takeaway indicator, that might be a minimum level to shoot for, for many types of production systems. Anabolic factors, we want diverse, high quality food supplies. Um, so you don't just want to do one type of input into your soil. You want to mix residues. You want to use some 
compost was made with a variety of materials. Maybe think about some mulches, um, we want living plant roots for as much of the time as we can possibly have. Um, and then we wanna have clay content, ideally. This is often hard to remediate if you don't have clays, right? Um, there's a lot of excitement about biochar as potentially an alternate way to get some of these clay-like benefits. Needs a lot more work. Uh, we're, for how many years people have been excited about this stuff, um, there's still a lot that we don't know about how to use it. <clears throat> and then again, there are some things you can do um, that would tend to increase the loss or, of organic matter. And if you overdo them, you're gonna have too many losses. So that would be failing to feed adequately, um, overdoing disturbance and tillage and having too much exposure to high temperatures. Okay, so there's some other ways you can directly test soil biology beyond just measuring and thinking about organic matter. Yes, there are, um, and this is included in some of the standard soil health stuff like the Cornell uh, soil health manual procedure. I think some of it has value. Um, it's another thing where you have to maybe experiment a little bit and see what kind of value it might add to the type of you know, gardening, farming, whatever you're involved in. Um, you can do direct measurement of microbial biomass, composition, and diversity. It's, these are tricky laboratory methods that are currently, in my opinion, suitable for various research purposes, but are not, for the most part, ready for prime time use by end users, such as gardeners and farmers. Instead, there are some things you can measure that reflect function or food source quantity. So you can measure total organic matter. And there's a uh, test for, it's called active carbon, that's essentially trying to test the amount of organic matter you have that's readily decomposable, that's suitable to act as a short-term food source. And that should correlate with the various functions that we care about. The other big function, of course, being respiration. That's just a measure of the total metabolic activity. These things are a bit like when you go to assess your health, your doctors measuring your vital signs. These are some very simple vital signs that you can measure. The actual application can be a little bit tricky. Um, again, bioindicators of, of having uh, macrofauna, different kinds of insects, earthworms are often just as, or perhaps even more useful in my opinion. And then at the bottom line, right, Going back to where we started with all this, plant health and vigor is really the gold standard. So I don't care what indicators you use for soil health. If your plants are not healthy and thriving, something is going wrong. Now, it could be that it's not a soil problem. It could just be a pest problem or disease problem that nothing that you do to your soil would do anything about. Um, but you could reason the other way. If your plants are, are doing just fine, then your soil health is probably fine. Right. And so there's a little bit of um, need to stay grounded here. If we pull all this together and we're almost done here, um, there's just a variety of things that you can think about and measure for physical, chemical, and biological uh, properties of the soil. It's the appropriate balance across all of these categories that's going to define soil health and what it means for you. And there's a variety of kinds of practices. I do like these four soil health principles that NRCS is pushing. I think these are good rules of thumb, although there's always going to be exceptions and corner cases and scenarios where some of these don't apply. But the rules of thumb being to minimize disturbance, that means um, you know, not overdoing those catabolic factors, thinking about when you dig, when you till, um, trying to not overdo that, although I think a little bit can be just fine, uh, in my opinion. Maximizing the cover, this is a really big one. Trying to keep the soil with you know living, living plant cover, uh, residues, um, cover crops, things like that. Maximizing the biodiversity, so rotations over time. If you are planting cover crops ever, you know maybe plant a mixture rather than just one type. Uh, and then this continuous living root presence in the soil because of all those benefits that we know accrue from living plant roots. So um, 
summarizing all this, again, think carefully about your unique ecosystem, your unique goals for gardening. What are you trying to create? Build organic matter through a variety of inputs that are matched for your goals. So not all these apply in all cases, compost, mulches, ground covers, so forth. Maximize that cover of green living plants and their root systems, minimizing disturbance where possible. Balance your soil pH and nutrient supply. Use some appropriate testing to at least get started on that process. And over time, you will learn basically what your soil needs for different kinds of plant production. And then you can switch to a more relaxed procedure where maybe you test every five years once you've got it all figured out. Remember that there's going to be no silver bullets for soil health. It's about bringing a variety of factors together in concert with each other and play around and experiment. But make careful controlled observations. So if you go out on search on the internet, you're going to find dozens, if not hundreds, of products that purport to miraculously improve your soil health for X, Y, and Z reasons. They may even have those like side-by-side -side containerized, you know, pictures where you've got one pot with a plant that's clearly suffering and another pot with a plant that's growing like gangbusters. And the implication is if you just buy this one Dr. So-and-so's magic soil juice, you're going to get this result, right? Think critically. You're there's almost certainly no silver bullet that's going to work across systems. If you do decide to play around with something, give yourself a control where that new fancy whatever, that new tool or technique or practice is just the only thing that you have changed. And make sure you're making a fair comparison. Don't go and compare fertilized to unfertilized plants, especially in the state of Florida. We know our soils are short of a lot of nutrients. So if you take care of the nutrient supply and then add the additional you know, magical product or practice on top of that, and then compare those results, okay? So that's, that's my message about that. Although I think there's a lot of fun stuff that you can play around with. Again, <laughs> healthy, vigorous plants that require minimal interventions um, is really the goal. And it's also the ultimate sign of having soil health. So with that, like the, uh thank you for tuning in i hope some of this has been useful and um i wish you well in all of your plant production endeavors